<laughs> okay. Oh, you got that recorded. <laughs> I maybe did. Here we go. That's all right. Okay. Hello. Hi, Jim. Hi, JC. It's so nice to meet you. How are you? How are you? Good. How, now, Good. How do we say your name? Jun Lee? Uh, it's Jun Lei. Jun Lei. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jun Lei. Uh, Jun Lei Lee. Is that, that's your last name, right? That's right. That's right. Okay. Great. Um, thank you for joining us today on the podcast because we... Um, we focus on the little things that make a difference in education. And I actually stumbled across your work uh, when I was studying psychological safety and um, an article that was written in um, the Learning Forward Journal, the Learning Professional referenced your work. Uh, it was by a, doctor, <laughs> by a Dr. Wanless. And I was like, wow, that looks really interesting. And so I dove in and I have since fallen in love, but um, let's maybe start off with telling us a little, little about yourself and what's your background. Sure. Um, so I, um, I'm John Laley. I'm uh, right now I'm a faculty uh, in early uh, childhood at uh, uh, Harvard Graduate School of uh, edu Education. And uh, previously I worked and lived in Pittsburgh and uh, was um, the director of the Fred uh, Rogers Center, um, a center that was established by Mr. Uh, uh, Rogers to continue on kind of his work um, in supporting children and families and teachers and so on. Um, That's wonderful. And how did, um, so you started working at the Fred Rogers Center. How did you start to see the potential of Fred Rogers' work for research? I think an important part about Fred's work um, is that he was able to articulate um, the science, the theories of human development in a way that is not only understandable um, to anybody, including three, four-year-olds, uh, but it's empowering and hopeful. Uh, particularly when you think about kind of the way Fred communicated about uh, the development of children and families to parents. He would never leave the parents feeling worse than when they begin. Uh, parents feel hopeful and more empowered in that process. So part of our work uh, has been thinking about what does it mean uh, to communicate and engage in the kind of research and practice work that not, not only get the child development right, but that leaves people feel more empowered and hopeful about what is it that they can do for children, for families, and so on. And so that perhaps was the biggest inspiration um, we drew from Fred's work uh, in terms of not just what he did, but why he did it. Do you feel, Junlei, that, that you're on this cutting edge and the reason I'm asking is we have had a series of episodes where so much of the same theme is really starting to, to become um, part of the forefront of the discussion, bringing in joy, making sure kids feel empowered, paying attention to the emotional needs of kids. You know, all these uh, levels, I guess, of, of this, in my mind, the same the same story. And I'm curious, do you find any pushback for the work you are? Or instead, are you kind of like riding this wave of, of some of the same questions that people are asking at this stage of our work? Well, I do think that there has been increasingly a movement towards um, respecting and honoring people's capacity to make a difference uh, in life, in, in their neighborhoods, in their schools. Um, I think over the years, um, well-intentioned research have a tendency to focus on deficits, right? The deficits mm -hmm. in our communities, the deficits in our people. And then um, when I think about early childhood uh, development in particular, I think often there's this kind of simplistic thinking and you asked about pushback. That would be some of the pushback that we get. Uh, people would say, well, 
aren't some people, they're just not cut out to be parents or teachers, right? So, so what I mean by simplistic is that there's this no notion then that there's some people, right? They're cut out to be with children, whether they're parents or teachers, and some people they're just not. And I don't think that is the case, whether you look at science or whether you look at common sense. And something that I feel very strongly that's supported by science, but as well as supported by everyday experience is something that Fred had often said, which is that we all learn and grow um, no matter how old we are. So nobody becomes this great parent when their child is born or when their child is five. And, and nobody is this great teacher on the first day of kindergarten garden or, or even a high school teacher, right? So um, the, 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 the kind of, you know, most parents, most teachers continue to learn, to grow. And, um, and, and when people point to, yeah, but, you know, let me tell you the story about this terrible parent and this terrible teacher. Um, yes, there are adults who really struggle in, in how they serve with children. But I think if we ask about these adults, the same question we ask about children, so when the, children, when the child really struggles, right, we don't ask, what's wrong with this kid? Right? You start to really think about what happened to this child and what can we support them to continue to learn and grow. And I think the same happens to grownups. Right? When you see a grownup really struggle as a teacher, as a parent, instead of just going, wow, there is something wrong with that person, you go, well, what happened to that person? And, 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 and what is it that we can do to support that person, to help that person learn and grow? Because every human being, right, from babies all the way up, it's this it's instinctive desire to want to learn, to want to grow, to want to be a better whatever for yeah. the people around them. Yeah. So I... Um... I love that. I, I actually participated, well, I didn't participate, I watched it after it was recorded, a webinar that you uh, facilitated. Um, and you, um, you talked a little bit about some of the research about how few words kids sometimes encounter in their homes um, and some of the research that's come out about uh, how that disadvantages those kids in coming to school, they have smaller vocabularies. But then you've kind of flipped that on its head and really filmed caregivers and talked about some of the strengths that they brought to the work, to, to the work of being a, a caregiver and, um, and how we don't, we, we need to start from there, from what people are doing well and build on that. And you even talk about that in the context of teaching, you know, really being able to film teachers and have highlight certain things that they're doing well that we want to emphasize and build on. Can you talk a little bit about your research where you filmed caregivers and what you discovered about some of their interactions with young children? Yes, so I think the, the one thing that we have found uh, in our uh, work as well as when we look across the work uh, when it comes to um, the impact of human relationships on, on, on children's development. I think the one finding that, that, that really stands out to me is that even brief, high-quality moments of interaction matter in children's development. Um, I think early on, uh, my work took place in the orphanage environment. And the orphanage environment uh, around the world is characterized by really high staff, uh, child staff ratios. So even in infants and toddlers, you may have two staff having to take care of a room of 25 or 30 infants, right? So, so it's kind of in our everyday life, it's unfathomable, right, how, how, how that works. And all these staff, they're not, you know, regarded or respected as teachers, they're caregivers, so they have to change the diapers and bathe and they have to get the food ready, they have to clean. I mean, just picture that scene, right? Mm -hmm. How much time do you think these staff have to actually be with the children? Very, very limited. But it's easy, right, to look at that situation and just go, wow, this is terrible, and these staff are terrible, these institutions are terrible, there's nothing we can do about it. But what, when we end, went into the field and start to observe what we noticed that is, is that some institutions and some staff, they're able to use these very brief moments like diaper change. In institutions, diaper change is very fast and efficient. It takes only about a minute, right? 
but they use that minute to the fullness of what that minute means. That they trusted themselves and they trusted the children. They knew that if all I had today is this minute to be with you during diaper change, I'm going to make the most out of this minute. They'll talk to the children, even if the children doesn't talk back. And um, and and there there was something really beautiful, like you know, on one of our videos, you have these you know tiny little infants, a lot of whom have disabilities, and you have the staff after the diaper change is complete. Right? You'd think, well, for the sake of efficiency, let's just pick up the baby, go to the next one. But what the staff would do is they would clap right, in, in front of the baby's face and they would twirl their fingers and they would wait because what they're waiting for is for the babies to reach up and grab their fingers so that the, the act of getting up would be a joint one as opposed to a passive one. Hmm. So, so it's these tiny, tiny little things, right? That, 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 that from the orphanage to the childcare in the United States to Head Start classrooms to just all these different places that we have been, what we have noticed is that those children's helpers who believed in themselves, who trusted themselves, who, who are deeply committed to their work would find even brief moments to have these high quality interactions. And that truly, truly matters. And, and coming back, um, Jim, to your point, about um, a lot of the talk about how many words a child is supposed to hear. Now, granted that the quantity at certain level does matter. But on the other hand, right, uh, when, when I think about you know, parents who work second jobs, three jobs, right, in order to make a living, the last thing I wanted to talk to their parent about is how many millions of words their child may be missing out. Um, I, I think what is so important for that parent to believe, to understand, is that the science says, even if you just got a couple minutes in the morning, a couple minutes in the afternoon, or a couple minutes on the weekend, what you do there matters. And I, I think that is the most important thing for teachers, for parents to understand. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I really thought that just the analysis of the videos that you've done and just being able to see things that we sometimes take for granted was so powerful. and. Um, so really empowering i'm an instructional coach and you know a lot of the work that we do is approaching you know what's missing and how do we add what's missing and um i like that approach much better of really entering the relationship from what's already there um, that we can just enhance um i, I wonder if you could talk about simple interactions because there are pieces several components of that and maybe help our listeners know what that entails Certainly. Um, so the notion of simple interactions, I think, came from what I was talking about, that, that we are seeing that in tiny little moments of simple, ordinary, mundane, taken for granted moments, right? There, there were these beautiful things that are happening. And we wanted to develop a tool, a language that help people um, to be able to reflect, to think about their, that in their own practice and to find that in each other's practice, you know, if you're within a community of people who are working together. And we also, at the same time, I think, want to debunk some of the misunderstandings of the power of human relationship. For example, uh, one of the misunderstandings is that relationship is warm and fuzzy, it helps you to feel good. But when it comes to learning or development, you need hardcore instruction, et cetera, et cetera, whatever it is, which is essentially this idea that relationships are nice to have, but it's, it's not enough. I think what we have found is there's this much broader idea of relationship, right? So anything we do that helps learning and development, it comes from these relational interactions. It doesn't matter whether you're playing or changing diapers or bathing or changing clothes or tying shoelaces, learning how to button your coat, or whether you're teaching algebra and calculus in high school. It doesn't matter what is it that you do, everything has to come through, through that quality of the interactions so that a human interaction is not just about feeling good, right? It is about learning. It is about feeling included and feeling like you belong. And it is about sharing of power, who has control of everything, who's driving everything. So for us, starting from the orphanage work all the way to our work with adolescents in group homes, four elements come together to make a human relation 
uh, uh, to make a human interaction developmental. Developmental meaning that it helps someone to learn and grow. These four components are connection, right? A sense of kind of, hey, these two people look like they're in tune with each other. <laughs> like they're, they're really with each other. They're, they're, they're being seen and heard. They don't have to be laughing and hugging all the time, right? Like imagine like you've ever played with a kid, you know, play chess or whatever. The two of you are like are serious. <laughs> and like you, you know, you're really competing with each other, but you're really together, right? That to us is this sense of connection. The second part is reciprocity or just this idea of back and forth, right? So if we're having a conversation, if we're kicking a soccer ball around, even if we're cooking together, it just seems like it's not just all like, I'm in charge, you need to follow. But this idea like, you know, like a ping pong or a tennis ball, right? It goes back and forth, back and forth in, in both directions. Like you get to serve, I get to serve and so on. The third part is the sense of inclusion and belonging. Now, anytime you have more than two people, there's going to be a person who have the risk of being left out. And in edu educational developmental environment, often the ones who are left out are the children who are least able to engage, either because of their ability or disabilities or temperament, or they're just having a bad day or whatever it is. And to the extent that we can bring them into the fold, right? That is a huge part of the human interaction. And all these three, right, connection, reciprocity, and, um, and, and, and inclusion ultimately sets up the fourth one, which is what we call opportunity to grow, right? That in every interaction, we have an opportunity to grow, to be scaffolded, to reach out for something that we, we don't quite know if we can get there or not. Even I'd imagine like even right now as the three of us are having a conversation, I find that to be an opportunity to grow, right? The way you asked your question, the way you se sequenced the question made me think about things in a different way or perhaps in a deeper way than I typically think about it. And, and, and these kind of interactions would happen whether in diaper change, in the example I talked about how, you know, the babies learn that I can go grasp someone's fingers and can pull myself up, that's an opportunity to grow. And, 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 and from diaper change to teaching of algebra, these opportunities grow are deeply embedded in these interactions. I'm, cu <clears throat> I'm curious if during some of these videos and these opportunities for you to see different levels, right, of, of adults or caregivers with kids, I'm fascinated about the, like the way that language takes place, not necessarily the number of words or vocabulary, right? We've got research on that. But I'm curious, and thinking back to some ethnographic studies that talked about with, you know, certain cultures or groups talk to kids, especially younger kids in almost like a baby voice, as opposed to talking to them as if they're, you know, they're people and referring to them and using different kinds of language. Have you noticed any patterns that way as well in just the research that you've been doing that the type of, of or the form of that communication, does that have any influence on that connectivity or on that inclusivity or, or even just allowing kids to, to experience that sense of growth? Yes, there are two Two things that really surprised me, but in hindsight just fascinated me uh, when you think about kind of language development across the culture, right? One is this idea that human beings, like uh, adults, I don't mean like uh, 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 professional early childhood educators, I mean like just parents, gra grandparents, when they're helping a child to learn to speak, right, they have this innate capacity to scaffold the children, mm -hmm. right? So, 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 so that during certain phases of children's language development, they would, you talk about baby talk, right? They, they would change their sound, they would elongate their words, right? You might say like, water, right? Yeah. You would slow down the words, you would exaggerate it. It sounds like baby talk and so on, but it's like human beings almost intuitively know, you know, no, no, you're just right at this moment. Like if I just stretch this word a little longer, you can hear better. And after about 100, 200 attempts, you might be able to pronounce it, right? And, and then, if, of course, you know, this is something that grown-ups do all the time. When children start to say words, but poorly, the grown-ups would try to repeat it, right? And so all these things, right, often it's untaught. It's just like human beings, because mm -hmm. language have evolved as part of what it means to be human beings, right? So, so we, 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 we must have these innate capacity to scaffold 
the learning around it. And so what that tells us in language development as well as in general is that there's this incredible evolved innate capacity in human beings to help the young learn and grow. Right? Of course, the knowledge and everything reminders helps, but just let's not forget that the human beings have evolved to help their young learn and grow, just like animals have. But because human behaviors is the most complex, then our capacity to teach younger children must have evolved to be more complex than typically what you would see in an animal. But then the other part that I thought was really beautiful is that I think sometimes by obsessing about the quantity of words, you know, yeah. or even the quantity of interactions, right? I think we're stressing ourselves and parents and educators out. Like an educator feel like, oh, what happens, you know, if my, my child's trying to get my attention and I'm just like busy or stressed out, I'm cooking or, or I didn't hear it. Like, am I going to do, do, do lasting damage, you know? And, uh, and a while ago, I came across all these studies that, said, that talked about how even well-to-do college-educated middle-class, you know, mothers, right? They miss their kids' cues like something like 40 or 50, 60 percent of the time. Uh, so, 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 but, but, but it's not like, well, if you're 100 percent, then your child will be awesome. No, actually, in, in language and specifically, it says there is a natural pattern, right, across the culture. So imagine a baby that start to say a word, let's say Baba. So in Chinese, Baba means dad, right? So, I mean, the first time my child says Baba, like, that's big news. I'm just so happy. Like, oh, she called dad. You know, I'm great. And then the child starts to use Baba for everything, right? Calling you, wants a water, wants to pick up, wants to play. Yeah. And, and then, you know, if you respond every time to Baba, right? And the child's like, I don't have to learn another word, right? I'm just, <laughs> Baba is going to cover it all. Yeah. So all of us, all of us, if we're not super anxious, at, at, at some point, right, by the 200th Baba, we're just like tuning out. We're like, what? <laughs> or just, we, we, we just tune out things that are familiar to us. So what happens, right? So at that point, we have a disconnect, right, between, um, uh, between the grown-ups and the children. And then at that moment, what happens is the child's like, wait a minute, I can't just rely on this one word. Like, I'm not getting the attention I need. <laughs> I'm going to practice a new sound. And of course, with their new sound, all of a sudden, right, we pay attention again. So this, this, this dance, right, between connect, misconnect, and the child yeah. try to connect with you by, by stretching him or herself, and then you connect again and misconnect. This was something that um, the, the, the research psychologist Ed Tronic um, and Beryl Preston, so they talk a lot about that kind of stuff right, in, 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 in the classical literature. And, um, and I'd only recently rediscovered it <laughs> when, because people keep asking me, like, we totally believe, you know, interactions are important, but how much interaction is necessary? And I could never answer that question, but I, I knew for sure it is not 100%, 100% of the time. And so then it was, it was, it was almost re reassuring to know that, that, that the imperfections of our interactions uh, developmentally can be actually exactly what children to need. Uh, yeah. exactly what children need to stretch themselves to do that. And it's not like, you know, we go out of our way to be imperfect. We just are. And, 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 and as much as our capacity as grown-ups, our capacity to teach children is, has evolved over millions of uh, uh, years to attune to children's development, I think in reverse it works, right? Children's capacity to learn have over millions of years have attuned to the fact of our imperfections, or I would say quote unquote imperfections. They're not imperfections. They're just exactly yeah. what it means to be human. Wow. Yeah, and also how reassuring that reminder that we innately have an understanding of what kids need in those moments, right? Of, of that language development. I appreciate that affirmation, I guess, because we all worry. That's right. And I think, um, so one of Fred's very early influences, Dr. Spock, Benjamin Spock, Dr. Spock's baby for parents and so on. And prior to Dr. Spock, they were literally kind of the best selling, you know, book for parents is called like the scientific manual. <laughs> How do you parent? So the idea is parents, you don't know what you're doing. The scientist is going to tell you. And Dr. Spock, uh, when his first book uh, came out, it was about, um, he called it the, like the common sense book for parenting. He, he really 
wanted to encourage parents to trust their common sense. And uh, Mr. Rogers followed suit. And, and I really think that broadly as a message, uh, uh, that is still incredibly important and in that all, you know, regardless of culture, regardless of uh, 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 language and, and even socioeconomic status, we, we can encourage people to trust their common sense, their capacity in being with children. And then, you know, of course, create a whole system of support so that they can actually be attuned and connected to their common sense, right? As opposed to feeling so anxious and guilty yeah. and stressed out that, that they, they try to do the things that they think they're supposed to do, as opposed to think about, you know, I see my baby, I hear my toddler. Like, what is it that I can learn from my own seeing and my own listening? Mm. Yeah. Will you tell the story about, um, I read in one of your articles, developmental relationships as the active ingredient and how you kind of came to that conception. I love that story with the toothpaste. <laughs> so um, so it, this story actually starts in, in my own failure as well as I think what I, I consider to be a failure of our field, which is that for so long, we believe that the only thing that's worth spreading and talking about are quote unquote experimental evidence, right? Stuff that are quote unquote uh, evidence based and so on. And, and, and so during a period of time, um, this was uh, back during the time when the federal government started to put together this thing called What Works Clearinghouse, right? Yeah. So, so, so the idea is let the scientists tell you what program has passed the threshold of what works. And then everyone, you, you know, from the classrooms to social services, you got to follow these programs. And, and the really odd thing that happened within the first, I think, four to eight years of the What Works Clearinghouse, which is that as they start to look at programs, curriculum interventions across the board, very, very few of them were shown to be effective once they scale up, right, to mm -hmm. a lot of things. They, they might have been effective early on in, in the laboratory, but when they scale up into, quote unquote, the real world, they don't work. So uh, about like somewhere between the fourth and eighth year, there was a nickname within the research community. It's, it's called Nothing Works Clearinghouse, <laughs> which is the, <laughs> the, the whole clearinghouse what, was, was showing that. So at the time I was at University of Pittsburgh, I was uh, uh, leading a team doing program evaluations, not on a national scale, but on local scales. And, and, and funders like governments, foundations, uh, United Way and so on were asking, you know, mom and pop community programs say, you know, you got to show me, you know, how, how you're improving the students' grades and graduation. It's so far removed, right, from what these programs are actually doing. So when you start to do these program evaluations, after a while you feel like, you know what, these programs are making a human impact, but our measures are not showing it. Right? So, yeah. so we have a kind of a local nothing works clearinghouse kind of effect as well. And as a program evaluator research, I was deeply frustrated because I feel like one, I'm unable to capture what really works about these mm -hmm. community programs. And at the same time, these community programs are under stress because the funders keep saying, well, you're not demonstrating income. I mean, you're not demonstrating outcome. How am I, you know, why should I keep funding you? So it was actually during this period of kind of frustration that one night, you know, I was supervising my girls, brushing their teeth. And, and if you've ever done that with kids, like they just have to keep it in there for two minutes, right? And there's nothing to do. <laughs> my wife had took all my magazines out of the bathroom <laughs> <laughs> and I had nothing to read. So the only thing I can grab hold of was the toothpaste. Like if you flip it around in the back, there's all these labels and ingredients. So I was just like mindlessly reading that. And then what caught my eye in the back of the toothpaste was this term active ingredient, which I have read in research before, right? In research, we call it critical ingredient or essential ingredient or active ingredient, but it never just hit me, right? But except when I saw it in the back of the toothpaste, and I was like, oh, there's active ingredients in that too. And, and, uh, and, and then it says uh, sodium fluoride, right? And what struck me wasn't the fact it was sodium fluoride, I always knew it was fluoride. What struck me was there was only one. There's only <laughs> one active ingredient because right next to it is this box with like 30 ingredients, but they were called inactive ingredients, right? But anyhow, it just hit me at that moment. Um, wait a minute. 
Like if all the work we're doing in communities, in classrooms, in national policy, if we like label them all, and then someone says, no, 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 you have to put one under the active ingredient and the rest under inactive ingredient. Like which one would you pick, right? To put under yeah. the active ingredient. And the answer later on, it was quite clear in science, but at, shortly after that, I was like, I thought through all the programs we're working with, you know, youth violence prevention programs, family support programs, early childhood program, Head Start. When I interviewed the actual social workers and home visitors and teachers on the ground, what they would say time and time again is it's the relationships I build mm -hmm. with the children, with the families, yeah. with my neighbors, with the community or the youth. And so the answer was so clear if you ask the people who are doing this work day in and day out. And it was out of that inspiration that I start to look back at all the research. And at least for me, I find this one common theme. And it's not just me. I think over and over again, I think people start to find this common theme that you know, it is this human relationship that is the fluoride. It's not that all these other things are unimportant. It's just that you can't, like in the toothpaste, you can't replace fluoride, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can't replace like bubblegum flavor, flavor with a mint flavor and it works just the same, but you cannot, you cannot replace the fluoride. And I think of that, that in the same way in terms of our work with children, right? That you cannot replace human relationship. You, might, you can change your curriculum, you can change your building, <laughs> you can change what you might call your program model. Uh, you know, in this group of young people, they can, they can learn through playing basketball, in the other, they can learn through playing chess. Like, like all these other things, right, you can switch around, but do not mess with the human relationship. And, and if you do something that messes up the human relationship, you're gonna tank this whole program, a whole model, a whole policy. That at least has been how we think about uh, human relationships as the active ingredient. Yeah, and I think what's so powerful about that is it's really reframed even my interactions with adults. Like I know your work is specifically about interacting with young children, um, but I just think that there's so much to learn about those simple interactions when it comes to everyday, just person-to-person uh, -person interactions. Um, so I've really... Right. I really, I, I feel really inspired by the work. I was, I was just going to say that, you know, unfortunately today, my colleague, uh, Dana Winters, who's the faculty director for the Fred uh, uh, Rogers Center, she couldn't join us. Uh, but one of the things she did, so I, I focused a lot of my, on adult child interactions. And when uh, she came from uh, uh, work with uh, uh, adolescents and prisoners and uh, families, and so she very quickly start to think along the way you just described, which is, wait a minute, it's a human interaction is a human interaction, regardless of whether you have a children or the adults. We, we, we have this, you know, free um, tool called Simple Interactions Tool that's on the website that anyone can download. And Dr. Winters used to always say, you know what, don't get hung up on the size of the head in the tool, you know, because it's as much about adults being with adults than anything else. And of course, you know, when you think about the work with children, so many of the interactions that happens are in fact between adults, between peers, supervisors, instructional coaches, mentors, uh, between teachers and families and so on. And, and, and the same pattern, the kind of things we talk about, you know, the, the need to connect, the need to share power, the need to feel, to help people to feel included and the need to be deeply invested and scaffold each other's learning and development. None of these things are exclusively child specific. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that is so true. And I think that we've started to see a pattern even within our, our guests that as we talk about what are the little things that make a, you know, a big difference in a school, um, I think that very often they continue to point back to what you just said about relationships. Um, you know, even a simple act of greeting at the door, right, as, a, as an act that uh, teachers can do when kids are entering the building. Uh, when you really look at that, it comes back to relationship. And, and we're starting to see, I think, that relationships, if, if it's not present, you, you will struggle to have the work um, take place that you need to, to help students grow and expand. That's right. And I think uh, when we worked in the K through 12 setting, right, early on, uh, we get some push back, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 um, there are some people 
who, who, who might say something like, well, my job is to teach, like I'm not their friend, right? Um, and, and I think our thinking over time is, no, 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 like nobody's asking him to be their friend. I'm not even sure if children are looking to a teacher as like, I want a friend, they want a yeah. teacher, right? But, but just like you said, Tracy, from how you say hello, right? To how yeah. you say bye, to imagine like, you know, you know how like, is this the common classroom scene, right? Kids are doing their work, right? And the teacher kind of walks around the classroom, looks over their shoulder, right? And so think of how, what a huge difference it would be for a teacher who walks by and go, no, 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 that's wrong, right? Yeah. To a teacher who comes over and just stays for 30 seconds longer and go, I see what you're trying to do there. Yeah, I, I can see that now. That makes sense. Now here, I noticed that like last week on the test, like you, that was what you didn't get, but I see that you get it now. Yeah. I, I like that. And then you move on. I mean, teachers are sharp enough, right, to look at a student worksheet and be able to know and to do that. But just, just that tiny little thing, right, changes what that teacher and student relationship is, right? It's not about being a friend. It's not even about, oh, I said that to make him feel better. No, you said that because that's what it takes to help a child learn. Um, not just to feel good, but to know what he's done well, and to know what she can do more of, and, 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 and to know what progress they have made beyond you know, whether or not they get an A or not at the end of the term. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Well, we appreciate you taking time out of a busy Saturday, and we know you have plenty of things that you could be doing. And we, so, we are so, so grateful for you to take time to help us uh, just have this conversation about relationships and the work that we do with kids and to be reminded about relationships. Our last question is, if you could jump in a time machine and go back to your younger self as you are entering into the research and the work with kids that you do, what advice would you give your younger self? <laughs> um, I would go back to myself when I was in graduate school. And I would go back to myself five years after I was in graduate school. And I would go back to myself again, 10 years after I was in graduate school and just look at my, myself in the eye and say, don't be so arrogant, <laughs> so arrogant. I don't care if you're studying for a PhD. I don't care if you have a PhD. I don't care how many papers you've read or written. Just don't be so arrogant, go out, right? Before you think about going out and telling a teacher or a parent like, well, this is what you should do and, and, and this is what you're doing wrong, just go out and listen to them, observe them, learn from them. You're going to understand much more about human development, about education, about teaching if you just are willing to go out and learn from people rather than just go out. And, 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 and just start to pick out everything that people are doing wrong and, and, and think that you with your research-based knowledge is gonna save the world <laughs> and pick them up. And uh, Mr. Rogers have this beautiful distinction that he made that I thought was just so powerful. I wish I read it and really understood it, you know, when I was a graduate student. Um, he's, he talked about, right, that the, that the single most important thing we can do, I don't mean as, a, as an educator, like just as a human being, right? The single most important thing we can do is to be what he called a helpful appreciator to the people around us, right? To be able to find and see what is best in our neighbor and seeing our, in our children, in our friends, in our elderly, and to reflect that back onto them. He thought there was nothing more important in the world than to be a helpful appreciator. And when I think back to when I was a graduate student and five years later, 10 years later, maybe even 15 years later, I think I was trained to be a helpful critic, which is <laughs> you, you just thought that, you know, you're trained with all the knowledge and skill just so that you can go out and tell people, well, this is what you should do and this is what you're not doing. Maybe there's a world and there's a percent of time having built the relationship, right, that sometimes you can be a helpful critic, but the larger picture, 
is that all of us, regardless of our degrees, our roles, and, and who we are serving, I think if we just start off with the discipline of being a helpful appreciator, that would fundamentally change what any educational yeah. and human development work is about. Yeah, well said. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much for, for everything that you're doing. And um, we'll have to connect with uh, Dr. Winters at yes, some point please, and, and please. get her perspective as well. So, um, but thank you for your time, uh, Junle. And um, yeah, I, I, I really, I feel really positive about uh, everything that we've learned today. So thank you. And I thank think our listeners patient. are really, it's, it's some brand new stuff that I think our yeah. listeners are really going to benefit from. So great. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. And please stay well and, um, and, and hope all of us get through this healthy yes. and sound. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye. Take right. care. Bye-bye.